of the Evergreen Friends and Neighbors, I thank you for being here. My name is Jan Marie Arbor, and along with my co-chairs, we've coordinated this event for the seventh ward, and any members of the City of Flint who are here, thank you all for being here. At this time, I would like to thank the many who have volunteered their time and their talent to make this forum possible, including event co-chairs, Jeanetta Ricks and Dr. Karen Weaver, moderator Phyllis Sykes, timekeeper Brianna Turner, all seven Ward Neighborhood Associations, Facebook friends, and media friends, including The Courier News, AC Dumas Radio Host at WFLT 1420 AM, and Dr. Karen Weaver, radio host at Superstation 910 AM. And thank you to the residents of Flint, from whom came many thought-provoking suggestions for questions this evening. I also wish to acknowledge and extend gratitude to the American Sign Language interpreters who will make it possible for our hearing impaired residents to experience this event. We appreciate the video services of Paul Heron and, and the audio services of Dwayne Clemens at Classy Moves Productions. And last but not least, I want to thank Ms. Deborah Holmes, Executive Director of the Brennan Senior Center. I'd like to thank the Brennan staff and volunteers for so graciously hosting this important community event. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. This forum is being live streamed to YouTube through channel Spectacle TV. The video will be uploaded to the candidates' Facebook pages if it's not already been done so. I urge you to share this forum via one of those options with friends and family who were not able to attend this evening. Now, if you would kindly silence your phones so as not to disrupt the recording of this event, that would be greatly appreciated. Again, please silence your phones. Thank you. Please note that this is a forum. It is not a debate. The purpose of tonight's forum is to enable residents to make an informed decision about who they will choose to represent the seventh ward in Flint City Council. Through a moderated question and answer format, you'll learn of the candidates' knowledge and thoughts on important issues relative to city governance and our lives. Time permitting, we may be able to take a few questions from the audience. Lastly, this election has been curiously attractive to a number of write-in candidates across the city of Flint. The seventh ward two has a write-in candidate, Ms. Lakeisha Turode. Due to time constraints, Ms. Turode will not participate in the Q&A. However, if she is here, you will have the opportunity to meet her following the Q&A. Ms. Turode will have two minutes to speak. And now, without further delay, please, let's join our hands together and welcome the seventh ward candidates, Allie Herkenroder and Monica Galloway. Thank you. <clears throat> Allie Herkenroder was born in Elkhart, Indiana. In 2017, she relocated to Flint after graduating magna cum laude from Spring Arbor University, where she earned a bachelor's degree in history and political science. Allie recently completed the Ann Arbor-based Ecology Center's LIFT, or Lead Impacted Families Training Program Intensive, where she gained a deeper understanding of lead poisoning and how to work for change in the Flint community by providing resources to its families. Since becoming a Flint resident, 
Allie has gained community development experience as an AmeriCorps VISTA leader and resources developer with the Flint Community School Corps, as well as a VISTA leader with the CRIM Fitness Foundation, where she provided resource development and support to Flint students and families by developing a program to reduce chronic absenteeism among students. Allie also worked within the Flint Housing Commission, serving as resident services coordinator, where she implemented a home ownership program and managed federal grant funding. Allie's volunteer experience includes that of program director for Hope at Howard, where she developed an after-school program for students and families residing at Howard Estates and affected by the water crisis. The program had over 30 participants attending on a regular basis, and their focus was on homework, music production, mindfulness practices, and financial literacy. In her spare time, Allie enjoys attending Flint City Bucks games, kayaking, and exploring the city of Flint. She has enjoyed being a coach for the Freeman School's Girls on the Run and organizing cleanups to help beautify our city. Allie Herkenroder is excited to run for 7th Ward Council Representative and to bring a new perspective to Flint City Council. Monica Galloway is native to San Diego, California. In 1995, she and husband Kevin Galloway Sr. and their two sons relocated to Flint, Michigan, where they successfully raised their family, who now have families of their own. Monica and Kevin are proud to call themselves grandparents to their first grandchild, Kevin Carter. Monica's professional career in Flint prior to government service includes retail management for Hudson's and Macy's, the banking industry as branch manager, personal banker, and deposit operations specialist, and in real estate, where she remains a licensed realtor. It was as a realtor that Monica was positioned to become intimately familiar with the city and a deep desire grew within her to help move her adopted home of Flint forward. In order to make a difference in her community, Monica decided to run for city council in 2013. She has since served as seventh ward councilwoman for eight years. Some of Monica's accomplishments as councilwoman include the demolition of blighted 7th Ward properties, including the Lippincott Avenue Trailer Park and Lapeer Road apartment complexes. As councilwoman, Monica has supported no water shutoffs and has opposed proposed water rate increases. She opposed the 30-year Great Lakes Water Authority contract and opposed an increase in the fiscal year 2021-22 waste collection rates. As a council member, Monica has allocated funds to senior centers and has advocated to increase the blight funds allocation. Monica's current board and trustee affiliations are numerous including serving as president of the Michigan Women in Municipal Government, second vice president of the Michigan Black Caucus local elected officials, and in September of this year, she was named president of the prestigious Michigan Municipal League. Councilwoman Galloway remains committed to the fight for education equality the fight for equity of resource allocation and justice for water crisis victims. She asks for your support in the election to further this work and more in service to the 7th Ward residents and the city of Flint. At this time, I'd like to invite our candidates to please shake hands. Thank you. And we'll turn the forum over to our moderator, Ms. Phyllis Sykes. Thank you. Thank you, Jan Marie. 
The candidates have signed an agreement of professional conduct, agreeing to conduct themselves civilly during this forum. Personal and or professional attacks are prohibited. The moderator will read the introduction to the question, followed by the reading of the first question. Subse subsequent questions will be asked in rotation. The candidates have up to two minutes to respond. No rebuttals are permitted. A tossed coin has determined which candidate will answer the first question. And the first question will go to Ms. Herkenroder. The role of city council member comes with a long list of responsibilities all of which are important to a well-functioning body representative of Flint and its citizens. As a council member, which would you deem to be the top three responsibilities to your constituents and tell us why? I wanna make sure, can you all hear me? Okay, um, thank you so much. Um, the most important thing, first and foremost, is making sure that we're communicating with our community um, as well as communicating with residents. So whenever problems occur, being able to alleviate that problem or direct them to the appropriate party. Um, we can't do everything as an individual, but making sure that we're able to solve that problem or work together to find a solution. I think secondly, making sure that we're able to uh, understand the financial situation in a very clear manner to be able to understand where everything is being allocated and how we can change that allocation to fit the needs of our community and our city. And I think thirdly, also making sure that we're able to communicate and cooperate among each other. I've said it before and I'll say it again, you don't have to like the person sitting next to you to work with them. Um, so you may not agree with the person who is sitting next to you in a different ward, but you have to be able to come together and support um, the city of Flint by working together with your fellow council people, even if that means disagreeing every now and again. Yes, Ms. Calloway. Thank you. Um, so according to the charter, um, there are specific roles and responsibilities that um, council people are required to meet. Um, part of that is allocation of money, but also it's being sure that appointed positions are filled by qualified people. Um, the city of Flint has been under an emergency manager twice since 2000, the early 2000s, and so the financial status of the community has been a concern for quite some time. So I would say making sure, one, you understand finances, you understand what budget processes look like, um, ensuring that there are leaders in those top positions for the community that are truly qualified, that they're not related to people, um, it says that you must vet them. And then definitely the um, coordination with the community to make sure that the community is aware of what is going on because budgeting is a um, reflection of the priorities of the community and without the community's input, you can't know where those priorities should lie. Okay, thank you. The former administration left the current administration a 24 million reserve during November of 2019. Today, the current administration projects a potential $17 million deficit. Can you explain how this administration used the 24 million and what, in addition to legacy costs, have contributed to the projected deficit? So the um, administration left under our leadership, we did have a $24 million fund balance. It's important to understand that a fund balance is required by the, the Budgeting Act of Michigan. And so with that $24 million, we were prepared and we've been hearing that our legacy costs would increase year by year by year. So part of the $24 million was used to, as you shared, balance the budget that was presented this year and adopted that was a negative $17 million budget. And yes, that was legacy costs. Um, part of that is we have a declining community. We um, have lost the revenues. But the other piece of that is the budget process wasn't handled properly. You can't just have legacy costs. You have to look at where the other cost is coming from. And that wasn't done. You cannot do a $73 million budget 
the way that we did it this year. Even in COVID, we did not have the necessary um, budget um, sessions that we were supposed to have. And so in essence, in, in my opinion, what we did is we adopted a budget without looking to see what we could do to change it. So thank God for the $24 million fund balance that was left by the previous administration because it was the only reason why this budget can be perceived to be balanced. Okay. Yes. Can you repeat that? That was a lengthy one. <laughs> okay. Question is, well, I'll, I'll give you the background too. Perfect. The former administration left the current administration a 24 million reserve during November of 2019. Today, the current administration projects a potential 17 million deficit. Can you explain how this administration used the 24 million and what, in addition to legacy costs, have contributed to the projected deficit? So I think I'm in a unique position because I'm not a current city council person, so I don't have access to all of the same documents as current city council people to know exactly where every single dollar and every single penny was spent with that. From my understanding of the budget, a lot of it was transferred to those legacy costs because we want to make sure that all of our retirees are supported in the way that they supported the city when they were working. Um, that being said, like Ms. Monica said, we need to make sure that we are able to make up for that deficit in creative ways. We need to make sure that we're able to leverage whatever kind of grant funding that we are able to to support other ways that city funding has been used. We need to make sure that we're able to support contracts that are within our financial means and we need to make sure that we are able to, to think creatively and innovatively about every single dollar that we have as a community. Um, I know that that's not the, the $24 million question, uh, but like I said, uh, once I'm on council, I'll be able to look a little bit more thoroughly into those details of that budget and be able to, uh, to be able to share that information with everyone. Okay, thank you. W.T. Stevens Construction Incorporated is a black and woman-owned company within Flint. The city of Flint owes Stevens over $1 million. Refusal of payment to this business not only reflects poorly upon the city, but adversely affects the bottom line of a minority-owned business that employs people from Flint and provides services to Flint. Please explain why the city has withheld payment to Stevens Construction and what is required for them to be paid. Ms. Um, Hergen wrote it. Yeah. Um, again, because I'm not on council, I can't answer that question as fully as possible, so I'm not going to sit here and speculate what the answer may be. Um, I think it's phenomenal, and I think that we as a city need to continue to uplift women-owned and minority-owned businesses, especially through that Section 3 provision of the federal law, um, and making sure that whatever reason for withholding of any payment is investigated to the utmost um, the most ability of the city council and um, with the, within the legality of it and understanding what's going on, but then being, again, able to communicate that back to the community. We need to make sure that there is transparency within the contracting process within the city, as well as the financial payment side of that um, within the city and within the community. So um, we need to just make sure that whatever reason for that is disclosed to the public. Okay, Ms. Galloway. Thank you. Um, so one of the things that is very, very important is accountability. The city council is responsible for accountability. We're responsible for ensuring that contracts are carried out. Now, originally we were told that W.T. Stevens, the area that they were dumping dirt, I don't know, um, was not maintained and it, and it didn't look well. But since then, they have provided paperwork, pictures, showing that that area has been not only cleaned up, it looks very well. But every time they do something, the administration moves the, the yard line. They, they tell them that the dirt needs to be here, and, and then they put it there, and then the dirt's not high enough. Um, one of the things I can say, in, in all fairness, we need to know that when you, there's a transition of administration, there cannot be the perception that anybody is being held liable for their support and or not support of a previous administration. It didn't just happen with W.T. Stevens. It happened with Big Brother, Big Sister. 
It happened with the McCree Theater. There was money that had been allocated and they couldn't get it. And you can say whatever you want to say, but the perception was those organizations supported the previous administration and so therefore they were targeted, if you will. What can the city council do? The city council has the authority to make sure that, that those contracts are paid. But when you have a divided city council, you can't have that happen. Okay, thank you. Describe for the audience, in layman's terms, the City of Flint budget apportionment and how it has changed over the last decade, both income and expenditures. I think I start right. Yes. So this is our budget. It's a very detailed budget. So anytime you go through a budget process, it's just like at home, you look at your bucket of money you look at your bu budget um, as far as what your allocations are, what your expenditures are, what are you spending your money on. And so what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to look at priorities. Public safety usually accommodates for just over 80% of our budget because that's the number one thing. We need to make sure that people are safe. And so when you are looking at the budget, you have to be looking at every line item. And sometimes the budget isn't presented in a way that is feasible for you to do that. And so you have to ask yourself, have we looked through every department? Where does the community say that they want money at? They say they want blight. How much money is in blight? What are we doing with the money in blight? Do we have the staffing in blight? So the expenditures in your, your um, budget is very important. But again, you have to make sure you have the revenue. So what are we doing to increase revenue? What are we doing to, to add value to the community? Can we use some of our block grant, grant money if we are not being able to fund those in the 101, which is your general funds? And so it is a very complex process, but when you have people that have educated themselves, like myself, I've gone through the Michigan Municipal League's um, training on finances to share with you what are you supposed to be looking at? What can you spend money on? We have spent many years spending money on um, projects that we can't, that are illegal, but we do it anyway. And so it's complex, but it can be done. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Herkenrotter. One of the things in that question, correct me if I'm wrong, is about how the budget has changed over the past decade. Is that correct? Correct. Well, we know from the results from the census that we lost 18,000 people in this city. We know that is tremendous impact on the tax revenue that we have um, for our constituents and for our city. So we need to make sure, again, that we're thinking creatively as far as where can we find dollars from the federal level, from the state level, from private institutions to be able to help bolster that budget that we have. We know we're going to have a certain number of taxes every year, so what can we do to help further that? Because we also know that the programs that we want to do are going to cost significantly more than what we usually have in the coffers. So we need to be able to uh, come together with different kinds of agencies and different kinds of governmental entities to be able to uh, collaborate as far as dollars are going. We're wasting so many dollars by doing our own programs at different levels. When we come together, when we repair those partnerships and those relationships um, with the school board, with this, uh, not city council, excuse me, with the board of commissioners, to be able to maximize every single dollar that is coming into this city and coming into this county, that is how we are able to make up for those deficits um, within our own personal budget. Okay, thank you. Please share your thoughts on the strongest and weakest points of Flint's city charter, and in particular, the effectiveness of the Ethics and Accountability Board. Ms. Herkenroder. Well, your second part was my first part to that question. <laughs> um, I think the fact that there are not very clear, um, if any, clear guidelines as far as the rules around the Ethics and Accountability Board have led to a lot of um, confusion as to their specific role within the function of city council and holding people accountable, especially within the ombudsman's office. Um, I would say that that's a very big weak point and expand that to the fact that there are so many other departments within the city uh, that don't have any rules or procedures written down or solidified at all. Nonetheless, um, them being in lockstep with the federal regulations that we need. For example, in 2018, the city had a tremendous audit finding where um, a particular um, grant form called an SF-424 was not submitted because there was no procedure in place 
to talk about who was going to do that and at what time. That's simply unacceptable. That's costing our city money, and that is a major weak point. As far as the strong side of the charter, I think it's phenomenal how we're able to uh, make sure that the bureaucracy of government is able to go through the appropriate channels to make sure that we catch things that may fall through the cracks in some regards, um, but then also making sure that we're able to engage the community in as many ways as we possibly can, and I think that the charter does a good job of doing that. Okay. Thank you. Can you, can you repeat the question sure. for me, please? Please share your thoughts on the strongest and weakest points of Flint City Charter, and in particular, the effectiveness of the Ethics and Accountability Board. Um, so the weakness in the charter is the charter lays out many things without detail. So it's as if someone gives you an overview, but then they force you to figure out how to implement it. Um, that's one of the weaknesses. In, um, the, the strongest piece of it is the fact that they did a new one in 2018. I'll just leave it at that. But with the Ethics and Accountability Board, the charter is more clear on the Ethics and Accountability Board than they are on the very legislators. And I reread it because I wanted to understand. The problem is, is that you have elected an, and appointed officials that are responsible for funding an organization and or um, office that governs you. And what does, that, what does that mean? They are responsible for investigating your behavior and your actions. And yet they can't do that if you don't allocate the money that they need. So one of the weaknesses is that the Ethics and Accountability Board doesn't have their own budget. $250,000 is not a lot of money. And they are very detailed on what they can do. They can investigate, they can subpoena, they can swear you in, and yet they get no cooperation from the people that they are called to enforce. And why is that? Because we say, we're not going to give you all the money that you need. We're not going to make sure you have a city attorney to make sure that you can subpoena us. We're not going to show up when you just asked us to show up. And so I think the, the problem with the Ethics and Accountability Board is that the, the very people that they're called to oversee is not doing what they're supposed to do, which makes them ineffective. Okay. Oh, you did it. You did, okay. <laughs> okay, moving on. Given Flint's long history of racial polarization, including segregation in housing and education, the seventh ward appears more integrated today than most wards do in large part to white flight. How will you serve the people of the seventh ward impartially and equally while a perception of covert racism persists despite its changing neighborhoods. Um, I believe Ms. Galloway. Um, you just serve people every day fairly and equitably as best as you can. Everyone in this community, regardless of their economic state, um, their social status, they deserve to be treated with the utmost respect. And as a public servant, it is my responsibility to do that, period. Everything else is irrelevant. Okay, thank you. Um, so one of the things about that was, you know, serving equi uh, equally, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I can tell you right now, I won't be serving equally, I'll be serving equitably because there are parts of this ward that have been so underserved for so long that they need more dollars advocated for cleanups. They need more dollars advocated for public safety than other parts of the ward. We can't give everybody the same, you know, same dollar amount and wonder why things aren't changing in a way that is fair for the world. We need to make sure that we are equitably allocating our dollars to support every single person who lives in the ward. It doesn't matter where, what neighborhood you live in, what part of the ward, whether it's north, south, east, west of the ward, or of the city, we need to make sure that all of our dollars are equitably distributed to make sure that everybody has the same chance for progress. Thank you. What might you initiate to help bridge historic divides within the seventh ward and bring more cohesion to the, word, uh, to the ward? 
Yes. Yeah, one of the things that is so palpable, especially when I'm out knocking doors and I'm talking to people, is how divided the neighborhoods are. And you can see where the redlining was, and it's very clear where that was in the history. And one of the things that we also can see that's very clear and very palpable is how uh, independent every single one of our Seventh Ward neighborhoods acts. And I think it's great how awesome we have phenomenal, uh, active neighborhood clubs within all parts of the ward, but we don't ever come together. And we need to come together because at the end of the day, we are all a neighbor of the Seventh Ward. We are all a resident of the city of Flint. We're going to be stronger together than we are in our own microcosm and making sure that we are able to come together, voice the concerns, be able to express the problems that are happening in different neighborhoods because the same problems that are happening in Fairfield Village are not the same problems that are happening in the Valley. We need to make sure that everybody comes together to share what is going on in their ward to be able to support that and the allocation of those dollars. One of the things that um, is very helpful would be um, meetings with block club captains to begin to see where that bridging can happen. In order to bridge the gap, there has to be a desire. Many times what I have found in my ward that um, areas, they enjoy their sense of um, ownership. They take pride in the ownership of it. And so asking the, the heads of those areas, what do you see would be an easy way to bridge? One of the things I can say is I'm experiencing, in, as the council person of the um, Seventh War for the last eight years, I'm hearing of more crime in the college cultural area than I've heard in a long time. And I've been over this um, community again for eight years. And why is that important? Because we need to be communicating with each other in all of the wars. Because when you do that, you can help to minimize even crime when you know each other. It doesn't matter where you live to make sure that we're partnering with each other, talking with each other. So my role in that is to do a better job at bringing the block clubs together because I do meet with them individually. And so that, that should be an easy one, but it does start with the heads of those block clubs. Okay, thank you. Political campaigns are usually very expensive. Considering the costs associated with campaign literature, multiple mailers, buttons, and special events. Have you received campaign contributions from any politicians at the local, state, or federal levels? If so, please indicate from which level or levels and the average contribution amount received. Ms. Galloway. So I have not received any money from any elected officials on the local, state, or federal. Um, I think I've gotten like $10 from Griggs, and I think I got like $125 or so from Kate Fields, but that's the only, the only money that I've gotten from any politicians. Okay, thank you. If you could change any council rule, which one might you change? <laughs> Ms. Herkenroder? Yeah. I think, I think it's more of not just one specific rule, but kind of the process of the rules. The fact is that council kind of operates with two separate rules. So we have Robert's rules of order and then we also have our own individual council rules. And I think that that sometimes muddies the water as to is this out of order? Is this not out of order? What's going on? Is this within our purview? Is this a violation X, Y, and Z? And I think that there's too much of the muddying of those waters to be able to clearly say, yes, no, you are in order, you are not in order. Um, so I would definitely make sure that we we're able to solidify, are we doing one set of rules? Are we doing two set of rules? Where are those rules gonna be? Which one's gonna overplay the other? Um, and making sure that that's very clear because we need to have clarity to make sure that we're not costing taxpayers dollars, uh, taxpayer dollars and city dollars and legal fees. Thank you. Ms. Galloway. Thank you. Um, so Robert's Rules originally when designed was designed for nonprofit organization. And even though legislators use it, it was never designed for legislation. Rules 
are always going to be helpful because they eliminate chaos. When you ask me what rules would I change or what rule would I change on city council, it's not about changing rules. It's about having respect for your colleagues. And don't get me wrong, we're always gonna have some sort of disagreement. But when you begin to use rules in an effort to call someone to be subject to you, it's unhealthy. And, and, I, and I wanna say to this community, I apologize if you feel like I've been combative, because I have, but I am an intelligent black woman that finds myself in an environment often where I am minimized, the things I say, you want to use the rules to say that I'm out of order, or you want to use the rules to let, allow you to be, uh, um, for me to be subject to you. That's unhealthy. And so there's nowhere that you can work that rules are designed for that. If we begin just to say every person that is serving here deserves to be here because they were elected to be here, I don't always agree with them, but let me give them the opportunity to see where they're going before I throw a rule on them, you would find that those rules wouldn't be necessary. So I wouldn't change rules, I would change people's ability to know that none of us are subject to each other. We are equal to each other. Okay, thank you. Residents have been grieved by the appearance of racist, gang-like council members who uniformly deploy divisive tactics to frustrate and stall progress during council meetings. Although it is expected that some differences will occur amongst individuals, Flint residents expect and deserve a well-functioning council that works cooperatively on behalf of their constituents. What will you do to avoid the race-based traps and divisiveness that interfere with council more effectively conducting the business that they were elected to handle? And Ms. I think Galloway. it's me, right? Yeah. So um, I don't think any of us will pretend that racism doesn't happen. It happens on the city council. One of the things that I was thinking of, though, is because there, there's this narrative that's being spent around that question and or council and its functions. Um, I have the privilege of serving in the Michigan Municipal League, and I have for the last eight years. And a lot of times you're told that if you find chaos everywhere you go, you might ask yourself what the common denominator is because it could very well be you, right? That's the reality. And so I have to check myself every day. And yet, with the Michigan Municipal League, I find myself in a environment where people that are more educated, they have more experience than me, and yet they value who I am to such a level that in a group of 19, I have the vice president, who is Caucasian out of Sterling Heights, nominated me for president. Why is that important? Because race isn't always the issue. It is how we feel about ourselves individually. And so sometimes that transcends racist, racial barriers, because there are going to be racial barriers, but that is illuminated if I'm uncomfortable with who I am, whether I am a black woman, that is uncomfortable in an environment with a Caucasian woman or vice versa. And so when I talk about the, the, the racial divide on council, all I'm gonna do is continue to fight for the community. I can do a better job, but I won't be oppressed in trying to serve the community. Thank you. I mean, we can't, we can't deny that racism happens, and I don't think that anybody is denying that racism happens. We just need to make sure that we, and I'll say me, especially as a white person, I recognize my privilege and I understand that I have um, different barriers and different not barriers because of just the way that the system was designed, which is why it's important for me, especially as a white woman, to be able to check that privilege and be able to say, what are the long-term 
complex text of this policy? What do we need to do to make sure that we are able to um, uplift all of our community members in a way that is productive for every single person? And that starts with being able to, again, stop and reflect and realize, is this policy going to be, a, is this going to have a negative impact on our community? Is this going to, but I, maybe I can't see it because of my, my white privilege. You have to be able to communicate with different people um, to be able to, to bring in all those different opinions and all those different experiences. I will never have the experience of a black woman in America because I'm not a black woman in America. That's why you reach out to your community members and your fellow neighbors and you talk through these really hard issues. It's not easy, but you gotta talk through them because you're not gonna grow unless you get uncomfortable. Now, the way that that translates into counsel is making sure that we aren't just assuming what someone is saying based off of who it is that is saying it or where we think they fall into these, you know, two different camps. We need to make sure that we're seeking to understand and we're not just listening to answer a question. We need to make sure that we're understanding the entirety of what is going on before we can make it or pass judgment. Thank you. The dynamics between city council members as well as between council and the mayor's office, have caused many residents to become disenchanted and apathetic towards civic engagement. This is evidenced by low voter turnout. What might you as council representative do to persuade those who lack inspiration to re-engage in civic participation? Ms. Herkimer. <clears throat> The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So if we continue to keep doing the same thing over and over again, like cause these really combative, argumentative, long, drawn out council meetings, we're not gonna change any of the way that our community is engaging in politics. A government doesn't work unless the people work too. And if the government official isn't being held accountable by the community, who knows what's getting, you know, what is happening behind the scenes that we may not know about. So one of the things that we definitely need to do is make sure that we are respectable for all of our community members, remembering that we are here to work for community, not the other way around, and also being able to engage the community in different ways. You have to meet people where they are, and that might not be on a Monday night at a council meeting. Maybe that's going through and doing a town hall in a different part of the precinct each week, or maybe that's doing um, a monthly cleanup to engage somebody who's really passionate about making sure that Pierce Park is clean, or Percy Park is clean, or hey, did you hear about this that happened at, uh, at council this week? Do you understand the implications of that? You have to meet people where they are. You have to get creative. You have to think innovatively. You can't just expect everybody in Flint to drop what they're doing at 4.30 on a Monday to come listen to a council meeting. We have to be able to get out and engage community in different ways than we have. Ms. Kelly, thank you. Um, so I just completed a government class over the summer and um, it talked about this very thing. Many, many times there are definitely things that can be going on different. But some of this stuff is by design. And you need to understand that my grandfather told me before he passed away, he never missed a vote. He died in 93. Because civil engagement wasn't a privilege for him. It was a responsibility. And so yes, you will get weary, yes. Way we should have long eight, nine hour uh, meetings. There's no question. But this is not the time to be weary. I'm weary every time I go into a council meeting. But you know what I'm not doing? I'm not quitting. Because as soon as we quit, things get by. We should never have an election where 5% of the community makes the decision on who serves the leadership. And so, yeah, hold us accountable. Come talk to us. But city council is not the only time with the seven more that see me. They see me when they show up at my house, when I go to you, when I find out what's going on with you and your daughter, when you need me to call your landlord to find out if there's anything that I can do to find out if there's more something that can be done between you and your landlord. So city council is not the only part of where you see Councilwoman Monica Galloway. And so I'm hoping that you guys don't forget that on November 2nd. 
I hope you remember when I showed up at your house, when you showed up where I am, because that's community, not what we always do in chambers. Thank you. Okay, this next question to provide context, a more lengthy introduction is necessary, so here we go. Due to the economic impact the COVID pandemic, pandemic has had on families and businesses, the federal government in March passed the American Rescue Plan Act, known as ARPA, and dispersed $1.9 trillion to cities, towns, and villages across America for use with businesses and community, for business and community restoration. The city of Flint will receive an estimated $99.3 million. In May 2021, Flint received an initial $47.4 million and will receive the balance in two years. All of this money must be spent within four years, or it will be forfeited to the federal government. To date, some cities have yet to announce their expenditure plan, while other cities, such as Detroit, have published a plan of expenditure and begun the process of investment. Flint has yet to provide the public with its plan of expenditure to present before council for consideration and approval. The mayor has reportedly met with business and community members for input on how the money might be spent, but the outcome of those meetings is yet to be known. As it relates to the specific groups and communities, some cities have planned to use a portion of their ARPA funds to provide summer reading programs for children, mental health specialists working with police departments, paying people living at homeless shelters to clean city neighborhoods, and home improvement repairs for seniors and the economically disadvantaged. These are just some examples of what is federally approved and the broad latitude of application with use of ARPA funds. And here's the question. In addition to the expectation that the city will apply significant ARPA dollars to fund public education, public safety, and blight elimination, what other types of projects might you imagine the people of Flint would want and benefit by? And that is to you, Ms. Kelly. So, um, housing, it, um, the, also what falls in there is um, the ability to help people with affordable housing. Um, Flint is very fortunate, fortunate in that we were one of the top three fund receivers. We were right under Grand Rapids, and our um, community doesn't fare as far as population. And the reason, the, the reason why I just wanted to say that is because um, one of the formulas that they used when they allocated that money was included some poverty. And so we can um, use the, the, of course, there's still a lot of um, things to, to play out, but um, affordable housing, um, hopefully helping some of our seniors are on fixed incomes and don't have the ability to make the necessary repairs to their homes. Um, foreclosures, people that may be struggling with foreclosure. Um, so there are other buckets, but also um, public safety. There is the ability to um, increase the wages for our first responders. Um, and so also, I'm sorry, another thing is lost revenue. Any revenue that was lost during COVID, that money can be used for. So there are other things that I believe the community would um, appreciate us allocating those funds for. And so, but we do still have to have more conversation. And city council is asking the mayor to share what he has learned throughout his ward by ward meetings with businesses and residents. Thank you. Thank you. So there's also a provision within the American Rescue Plan Act ARPA, um, where cities can improve water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure. 
One of the things that we have the power to do that can do, we can do kill two birds with one stone. When we invest in our broadband infrastructure, I guess it's more than two, two birds. So when we invest in our broadband infrastructure, we are providing connectivity for our students who have been out of school for over a year. For example, um, there was a woman who I was speaking with last summer who, to see if she needed a computer for her grandchild um, for school. And she said, well, no, I already have a computer, but I don't know how to hook it up to the internet, so it's just been sitting here since March. That means that that child has gone without school or without education for months at this point. And what are the long-term impacts of that going to be? And not just for this child in particular, but for this being all across the city. We know that that's not a unique experience. So we need to invest in broadband infrastructure and make it um, so that broadband infrastructure is a uh, similar to like consumers, where it's a utility, not a luxury. We can have connectivity for our seniors who we know experienced tremendous loneliness throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so connecting students, seniors, being able to make sure that everybody has access to um, the world that is. We can have so many more people who are able to work from home now. We don't have to worry about covering childcare costs. We can save people money by changing the way we're thinking about something like internet. Um, I know what my was at the 30 second thing, okay. Um, we can also work together with our partners at the county and the school board to make sure that we're maximizing every single dollar that has been brought into this community. So you said, I know there's $100 million going to the school board, there's about $78 million going to the county, and we know that we're having about $93 million for the city. That's close to $300 million that we can invest in tremendous ways for our community. Thank you. Due to water line replacement, thousands of flood homes are yet to have their driveway and or sidewalk restoration completed. Homeowners cannot be expected to live with destroyed driveway and sidewalks indefinitely, while the city claims to have run out of money to complete the work. In the event that ARPA funds are not permissible for use per federal guidelines, how should homeowners expect completion of this work to be paid? I think again, that's where we need to think creatively and look creatively at the options that we have, not just in the city, but also in the county and the state and the nation, um, to see what ways we can fill in those gaps. But we need to make sure that we have a steady inventory and a steady database. Who needs what? Where do they need it? How long has it been without? That way we can triage everybody to make sure that we are serving the people who have been experiencing torn up sidewalks, torn up driveways, portions of the street that are still cut up and filled with gravel over and over and over again that they basically almost repay for themselves because of how much has been compressed. But being able to make sure that our citizens get what they deserve, whether that's engaging in grant funding, whether that's looking to the Department of Transportation to say, hey, this is within your wheelhouse. What can we do to work together? Um, and maybe even potentially the American with Disabilities Act. We know that not very many of our sidewalks are traversable for those with uh, disabilities or mobility issues. So how can we think about all of these different funding sources that are out there to be able to get creative with how we are going to repair this? The first question is, um, we have been unable to find out how $120 million is already spent and, and, and doesn't complete the restoration. So I can't even answer that question because to date, we have not received a bank statement, if you will, that shows that that money has been depleted to such a, 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 a level that the restoration is not complete. Now, as a council person, the last restoration contract that I approved, it was under the assumption that it would complete all restoration. And so now in doing the research to date, no oversight, supposed to be oversighted by the state of Michigan, Eric Pocan. There's supposed to be a, he's over it, um, haven't been able to get the answer. So, I'm sure we can be creative, but it's going to be hard to be creative to any philanthrop, um, the Mott Foundation or any of those other um, organizations 
when you can't explain to them how you could get so much money and not get the work done. So um, how about I just put a pin in that one okay. and hopefully we'll be able to get some answers. Thank you. Urban decay is the face of much of Flint with abandoned properties and burned out buildings littering its streets. Blight reigns with graffiti, illegal dumpings, unmowed grass, unswept streets, clogged street drains, and crumbling structures. These problems are symptomatic not only of apathy, but of abandoned industries, a declining economic base, and a declining population. Tell us what can be done to effectively address blight in the short term, and what must be done to conquer urban decay and blight moving forward. Ms. Galloway. So I'm proud to say, just spoke to Michael Freeman today, director over the land bank, and the Robert T. Longway Apartments are due to be demolished this winter. It is a winter demolition. So the um, RFP has gone out. Um, the RFP is going to require whoever gets the demolition of that to demolish that by February of 2022. So that's good news, short term. Working with partners, the land bank, the land bank owns a lot of our blighted properties. Um, did recently just learn, thank, thankful to Norma and, and her communication, even with um, Miss Alley, that um, Crime Stoppers has the ability for you to call in tips on blight, those that are dumping in our community, those that are um, coming into our community, and if you call Crime Stoppers, you are able, and, they, and there's a, a process, and, and we'll make sure that we, I'm sure you'll probably hear more about that, but I didn't know that. And you can actually call in, report it, whether it's anonymous or not, and if it leads to a, an, an arrest, you will be compensated for that. But in order for us to clean up blight, we all have to be responsible. We all have to say something when we see something. We have to make sure that we are deterring. Help our neighbors, everybody that lives in a house, whether they're renting or owning, some of them are owning for the first time, so they don't really understand the upkeep. So we can help in our community, whether I'm mowing the lawn of a land bank property, and so we've got to be creative, but working with the land bank, what our county commissioners, our county commissioners are over the land bank. The land bank is a purview under the county commissioners. So doing a better job at working with our partners to make sure that we eliminate that blight. I think in the short term, I, I know especially during this campaign cycle, you've seen so many people, myself included, doing all sorts of cleanups, which is great, but how are we going to keep that momentum going? We know that we can't have this huge cleanup every single weekend. We need to make sure that we're taking our own uh, responsibility and saying, oh, I'm not going to throw this Doritos bag outside of my window on my way down Door Highway. We need to make sure that we're doing those little things within ourselves first, because we also need to make sure that we, especially as leaders within our community, are exemplifying what we want to see within our community. That being said, we also need to make sure that we're engaging our residents who have a special like uh, physical and mental health concerns that are make it a really, really big deal for them to be able to get out and mow their lawn. I know there's so many people in my neighborhood in particular, they have joint issues and managing a lawnmower is just too much for them and they physically cannot do it. So being able to extend courtesy to the other, whatever that other may be or whoever that other may be and say, hey, do you need some help? Hey, how can I help you out? And extending that neighborliness. As far as the long-term aspect of it, we need to make sure that we have transparency within the land bank process as far as who gets a house, who doesn't get a house, and why didn't you get a house if you'd applied for one? We need that transparency within that process so that we know why people aren't becoming homeowners who desperately want to be homeowners and why other people are getting homes and we've never heard of them before. So we need to make sure that we're able to have that transparency and working together with the county commissioners and with the land bank to make sure that that process is clear, clear cut for everybody who wants to own a house. Thank you. Yellow and white signs freely and illegally cover light posts throughout the Seventh Ward and city, soliciting the purchase of homes and cars or promoting get-rich schemes. These signs are not only an eyesore contributing to blight, but they take advantage of the ill-informed and economically disadvantaged. 
If no ordinance exists condemning these forms of blight and economic exploitation, will you as a council member support creating one? I would, absolutely, especially because it's, it's just like predatory lending. It, it's, that's a federally regulated aspect. We can absolutely regulate things like that. And even if there is something that is in, in, uh, that is an ordinance right now, I apologize, I don't know every single ordinance in this city because we have hundreds of them, thousands of them, but being able to step up and say, this does not belong here, I am going to take the responsibility and I'm going to take this sign and I'm going to put it in the garbage. Okay, thank you. Ms. Galloway. Yes, so I'm currently working with our um, Chief legal, legal Officer, Angela Wheeler, about that very thing. So I've gone throughout the community taking pictures of um, those signs. And um, the, the other piece of that, though, is enforcement. It's not just that they're, that they're blighted. We have to have enforcement. Right now, in our blight department, I'm, I'm sad to say that the entire blight department is turned over. Um, Raul Garcia, first person gone in blight. The person that, I mean, anybody that's in this room that has ever called Raul Garcia, you call Raul Garcia and he'll be at your house seven in the morning, eight in the morning, weekends, it didn't matter. The whole blight department is turned over. But in addition to that, who is enforcing these ordinances, even once we have them, if we don't have an enforcement officer that is able to do it, that is able to take it to court, that we actually have teeth in, we see reoccurring things. I think it's a great idea to remove them, but eventually the, the residents, we pay taxes to make sure that these things are enforced. And so um, I am working with, like I said, Attorney Wheeler, but also making sure that we um, find out from the administration who, who's enforcing this and what does that look like? Where does the community call? We need to include all of that in the ordinance. Thank you. An ordinance has been proposed to confiscate vehicles driven by reckless drivers disrupting the safety of our streets and the quiet of night with needless dra uh, drag racing. Is vehicle confiscation an equitable solution or an unnecessary hardship imposed on reckless youth? If confiscation isn't the answer, then what other solutions to stop this behavior might there be? So it's a little bit of both, and you, you, I mean, chances are it's not going to be equitable because many people um, can't afford, I mean, I'm, I, I do pretty good. I, I can't afford for you to take my car, though. Um, the towing fees, if you have, but the other piece of that is we're responsible for the behavior of our children. We are responsible. And so if our children don't understand the risk that they put us in, when we give them the keys to our car, then we have to deal with the consequences that come with that. And that was a hard ordinance for me to deal with. But the reality is, let one person die and this community will be outraged. And so we cannot wait for tragedy to happen. And so I'm hoping that this ordinance will cause people to ask themselves, we, and, and I don't know about you guys, I know my kids. I know what my kids might or might not do. I'm not blind to it. And so we have to know, you know the difference in your vehicle when it comes back. And so as a community, we have to hold people accountable. And unfortunately, the parent, if your, if your child is driving your car, that means you're responsible. When you give them the key, the insurance company too. Nowadays with your insurance, if your kids are not on your insurance and something happens to your car, the insurance company is not doing anything about it. So this isn't something new, but if it's going to affect you negatively, we have to start making strong um, um, charges inside of our homes so that we can make sure that we're not one of the ones that are negatively impacted by that ordinance. Okay, thank you. This, this is one of those issues that has really, really been a struggle because I don't think the forfeiture of a car, I don't think it's equitable, I don't think it's the right thing to do, I don't think it's going to have the kind of impact that we think it's going to have because at the end of the day, people are going to keep drag racing. They're going to find another car to drag race, whether that's their, their cousin's car, whether they go to a... a enterprise and rent a car, people are already renting cars and doing this. 
it, it's going to keep happening. So what we need to do is think about the solutions to have this so people have something to do. They're going to keep drag racing. Why don't we build a drag race strip? Why don't we find something for people to go and do this? They're going to keep doing it whether or not you take their car. It doesn't matter how good of a parent you think you are or not. Kids are going to do what kids are going to do. I mean, that's, that's at the end of the day. We all know that. So we need to make sure that people are, have safe options because we don't want anybody to get hurt. In the short term, we need to make sure, though, that we are enforcing this by slapping a big fine on somebody or making sure that they're aware of what's going on. We need to improve our traffic camera system so that we know which cars are doing it. So even if we don't have a police officer there within three minutes of this happening or it being called in, we show up at their door the next day and say, hey, guess what? We, we caught you because we need to make sure that our community is safe and we need to make sure that there is a safe outlet and a legal outlet for things that people are already going to keep doing. Okay, thank you. Rising homicides in the ward and throughout the city are an overwhelming concern. There has been advocacy for a portion of federal ARPA dollars to be used to enhance public safety by use of high-tech surveillance including camera installation at strategic locations. Other tools suggested to assist with crime deterrence include the funding of residential doorbell camera security devices and making upgrades to street and home lighting. Considering the city is significantly short on officers and all options should be explored, would you consider the use of unmanned aerial vehicles or drones to be an acceptable surveillance tool for police use, despite the privacy issues that surround them. I know at the county level they already have some people who are droned, so a, a little bit of or drone certified. So a little background on that: in order to have anybody controlling any kind of drone or anything like that, they have to be FAA certified. So they have to go through that specific training so that they are more aware of those privacy things. We know that there's not going to be every single protection regarding privacy, um, but I think that it's definitely an option because again, we have to be creative in the options that we explore. Um, and I don't necessarily think that a helicopter is the best option for a city of 82,000 people, I think that we should have gone in the direction of drones to begin with and updating different, you know, preventative measures, like you mentioned, the doorbells, the street lights, everything like that. If we can be as preventative in nature regarding crime as possible, that's always going to be better than being the reactive side to crime as possible. So I am all for um, utilizing any kind of dollars wherever they come from. Um, to make sure that we are utilizing those preventative measures to, to, to deter crime and homicides in our community. Ms. Galloway. I think the key word for me, or key line, was I think you said in spite of privacy issues. Is that, was that correct? Despite the Despite. privacy issues. Yeah. So um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that we should um, do anything despite privacy issues. And the reason why I say that is we, we have to vet what are the privacy issues and, and who are the people that are responsible for those operating those things. And will they be doing them in a way that ensures that they are only looking for things that are illegal? And so I, I believe that based on where we are in our society, with the privacy issues that we can't eliminate that piece. I am all for doing whatever we can to eliminate crime in our community any way that we can make the community feel safe. But that privacy issue is a concern for me. We have a large population of elderly people some that live alone. And so if we, in fact, try to do this in an effort to eliminate that, if it becomes worse, then we've been counterproductive. I don't know if I'm making sense, but I think that we must investigate what those privacy issues might be, eliminate them, put things in place to make sure that there is accountability and oversight, and then absolutely do it. Okay. Thank you. In an effort to help curb crime, Councilman Alan Griggs has recommended that an ordinance be put in place to close all liquor sales 
across the city of Flint at 9 p.m. Would you support this proposed ordinance? If not, why not? I think I'm first. Ms. Galloway. So, so I think my question would be, are we just saying that liquor can't be closed, I mean sold after 9 o'clock, or closing the entire liquor store down at 9 o'clock? And I think that there are, are two pieces of that. Well, the question is liquor sales. Sales. Mm -hmm. So I would support that absolutely, as long as it didn't violate the state statute over liquor, absolutely, because at, in my opinion, you don't, if, if you haven't bought it by nine o'clock, then you probably didn't need it. And so, yes, I would absolutely support that as long as it was not detrimental um, to the store. And one of the things I, I just want to add to that, we have to make sure that we're not um, hurting our business owners um, in, our, in our efforts to be um, zealous because recently we had a business owner that was actually a resolution before us to send a resolution to the state of Michigan pulling his liquor license. And he was portrayed as someone that was uncooperative, only to be invited to the city council meeting. And not only had he been cooperative, but he had been beat up by people that were um, at his store. But in addition to that, he was one of the first business owners to accept the cameras that had been in place under Chief Johnson. So we just want to make sure that we're being fair to all of our business owners. And yes, I would support that if that did come before us and it wasn't a violation of the state law. Okay, thank you. Um, I would not support the ordinance ending at 9 o'clock. I think that we need to remember um, that we, we all live different lives. We all live a little bit of unconventional lives. Not everybody works a 9 to 5, so making sure that um, you know people who work on third shift are able to get your second shift are able to get you know maybe maybe they're after their after dinner cocktail I mean we don't know what everybody's situation is I do believe that we should limit the number of liquor license and the number of times with the liquor sales to ending at midnight though and making sure that the number of liquor licenses in the city um, does not continue to grow um, there are studies and I, I know for sure in Pennsylvania I believe there's also so one in Michigan as well um, that talk about the reduction in teenage crime, um, especially when teenage and young adult crime, when liquor licenses are limited within certain areas as well. And if that is another way to prevent crime from happening, I am all for that. But I also want to make sure that we are supporting our community members who may have unconventional work schedules um, and also our business owners and making sure that they are able to continue uh, their entrepreneurial spirit. Okay, thank you. Environmental racism is a well-known part of this country's history and also of this city's history. Please explain your position in favor of or in opposition to the proposed construction of the Ajax mm -hmm. Asphalt Plant to be built at the northeast point of Carpenter Road and in near proximity to public housing. Yeah, it should absolutely not, not be built 1,100 feet from a public housing project on the north side of Flint. That is completely unacceptable, especially because the way that the testing that was done by um, Eagle, which is former uh, DEQ, did not account for a lot of different kinds of chemicals that will be getting spewed out of this permit, or uh, excuse me, out of this uh, asphalt plant, including something called hexavalent chromium. I don't know if any of you guys have seen Aaron Brockovich, but that whole movie is all about the destruction of hexavalent chromium on a town. Flint does not need any more kind of environmental destruction in, its, in anywhere within its air, water, soil, anything, period. Okay, thank you. Ms. Galloway. No, I don't support it, but I will say that the wonderful thing about it is it was a humanity thing. And so when you saw people that were out there um, protesting that project, it, it, it reflected community, not just those that lived in that area. And so that was very encouraging. Okay, thank you. In an effort to keep Seventh Ward residents up to date regarding city services, special programs, public safety, residents have requested regular and frequent communication from our council representative. If elected, by what means and how often will you communicate with or meet with your constituency? 
So one of the things that I am going to do is I am going to start a Tuesday table talk and I'm going to get on Facebook. <laughs> I am. Um, the other thing is um, I already meet with the block clubs and I want to thank um, Janetta for um, re-engaging our Evergreen Valley Inn Estates and um, Norma for always inviting me to their um, neighborhood association, Mike Keeler. But yeah, that's, that's what I'm gonna do. And then um, also I, I do a, um, spend a, quite a bit of time with our seniors um, over in, um, on Court Street. And so, but yeah, that, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna step out of my comfort zone and have a Tuesday table talk with Councilwoman Galloway. Okay, thank you. Ms. And quarterly meetings, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Quarterly meetings. Ms. Hockenwalder. Yeah, so I'm really uh, excited and proud to say that we were able throughout the last month to be able to go to each precinct within the seventh ward um, and do a community come together event where we were able to engage in different ways and learn about um, the, the topics that matter most to the community because it doesn't matter what I think is the most important, it matters what the community thinks is the most important. Got some really, really good ideas from a lot of different community members and excited to help implement those ideas as well. Um, but being able to maintain contact with people on a regular basis, whether that be through email, phone call, I get Facebook messages all the time, um, posting about uh, important things that are happening in our city and that affect us um, on Facebook, on a website, on whatever form of method of communication. We need to make sure that we're meeting people where they are for whatever method of communication that may be. One of the things that I also really want to look into is the possibility of robocalls or texts. If there's something in particular happening in a certain portion of the ward that's going to affect a neighborhood regarding I don't know let's say the 16th water main break on Court Street this year um, so making sure that we're able to communicate to a wide group of people in a very quick way there's resources out there and being able to utilize everything that we possibly can to engage everyone okay over the recent years participation in block clubs and neighborhood associations have diminished significantly within the seventh ward do you have any suggestions that might help increase residents' participation in these important clubs and associations? Ms. Herkenwater. Yeah, I think, I think having really strong engagement, not only within the different block clubs, but also within Flint Neighborhoods United, so that everybody knows where to go and when to go and everything like that. And I know that COVID threw a wrench in everything because so many platforms switched to that virtual platform, but we need to make sure that that's still accessible. So engaging whatever kind of um, social media, website, I don't know, a lot of people use Twitter, I don't, but you know, text messages, I know yard signs are used a lot too, um, but making sure that people understand the importance of what black clubs can do and their role within community um, because I don't think a lot of people realize how important black clubs are um, to getting things done especially within their own in individual neighborhood so I think it would be really cool if we did like welcome committees for people who moved into the ward um, hey did you know trash day is this this is all the guidelines from the trash contractor X Y and Z and just kind of having something already put together um, just like a I don't know, a ward or a neighborhood how-to manual or when things are FAQ manual um, so that people know where to go. Because sometimes it can be overwhelming if you're not sure who to go to and who to turn to. And, you know, maybe you just show up on the right person's door one day. Um, but making sure that we're doing our due diligence and reaching out to especially our newcomers. Thank you. Marijuana sales are legal nope. in the state of Michigan I don't think as I a result. That. Related businesses it. are popular. I didn't answer that. Pardon me? I didn't answer that. Oh, you didn't? Oh, I'm sorry. That's I'm okay. sorry. That's okay. Um, one of the things that I really believe is the residents that are engaged are the best billboards. And so even having a day, a Saturday, where you go and you knock on the door and you talk to your neighbors and you tell them, hey, we're part of the block club, and tell them what the block club does. Because people want to know that there's value in being a part of it. What does it look like? Um, am I going to be called by somebody? Um, and if um, dues are a barrier, I'm really um, grateful in, in our um, block club, um, we have a dollar amount, but 
it'll be donations too, because it's not about that. Those things are for administrative things, but we just want you to be engaged. We want you to know that there are people there. And so letting them know, getting to know your neighbors, because block clubs are about getting to know each other so that you can watch out for each other, know what's going on in the community, be able to communicate. And so I think the best way to build that engagement is each person making sure that they're taking part in recruiting other residents in the, in the um, neighborhood. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Marijuana sales are legal in the state of Michigan. As a result, related businesses are popping up all over the place, including the Seventh Ward. Can you speak to the limit of facilities allowable within our ward, the city, or other defined areas? And if there are no limits, should there be? So I am so sad to say I thought we had a limit. And just recently I learned that we don't have a limit. Um, yes, I believe that there should be a limit. And the reason why there should be a limit is because you, you need to look at population, but you also need to look at where they are stationed. Um, the community is changing. The seventh ward at one time, we, if I'm not mistaken, we had the most and that became very alarming for us. And so, so yes, we do need to look at, um, reevaluate what that looks like, how many we have, and yes, there should be a limit. And there definitely should be a limit um, on, in wards to me, making sure that there is um, equity in that if, if the residents of the city of Flint want it. I think there should be a limit to you. I think it should be regulated just like liquor sales as well, um, where there's you know a certain limit and a certain process as far as um, the way in which that licensing process occurs too, but also making sure that we hold um, dispensaries accountable for, um, there's a provision in the licensing process that there's a certain portion of their, I don't remember if it's their sales or um, their yearly anticipated revenue where they're required to give back to community. And we need to make sure that that aspect of things is continuing to happen for sure. Um, I think that there, like I said, there needs to be that limit within the ward. I think that there needs to be a limit within a geographical region within that, whether that's a 20 mile radius, there can only be one or two or um, whatever that might look like. Um, but again, it doesn't matter what I think, it matters what the community thinks and how we can move forward together um, to find a compromise or what have you to make sure that everybody's opinion is represented as best as possible. Thank you. Have you accepted campaign donations or endorsement from any owner, uh, or, owner or owners of a marijuana-based business or business interest? No. Thank you. At present, the administration's blight department is understaffed and overwhelmed and incapable of effectively addressing blight properties. What can council do, if anything, to assist wards with potentially identifying and obtaining grant dollars to address both blight and beautification projects? So um, there is a um, beautification grant that happens through the land bank there are um, grants available through the city of Flint. The city council does not oversee the grant process. So that is done um, through the administration. There's a, a list of all the block grants dollars that are given out. Um, and so I, I, I just want to make sure that residents know that that's not the role of city council. City council is responsible for seeing how the block grants are allocated, ensuring that there is fairness in that process, making sure that there are no um, gifts, if you will. Um, so vetting that process, but in helping residents to engage in how to get block grants or grants for beautification and blight. We have dollars for blight. Um, we have a um, budget for blight. And then also, like I said, leveraging what the, the county has since they're over the land bank. Um, but we, we wouldn't guide you into where you can find grant dollars. Okay. Thank you. I think one of the things that we can, can 
that we can do a lot better is making sure that people know where to go for different resources, especially if they want to host a cleanup. I know a lot of people don't know about the tools from Keep Genesee County Beautiful and the fact that they will give you gloves, grabbers, whatever kind of tools you need, uh, trash bags, yard bags, things of that nature for free. All you gotta do is fill out how many bags of trash you did and how many people came. A lot of people don't know about that, so we need to make sure that we're a lot better at sharing the resources that we have within community um, so that people have a, a place to start. Um, because there is a lot of money, especially within the blight el elimination aspect of things within the city. A lot of people just don't know where to start. So being able to be a sounding board for whatever those resources may be, and then also being able to have, sh have a transparent process as far as the scoring of different grants and why some grants were granted and why others were not, um, making sure that that is, that is accessible to community. Okay. Thank you. A proposal has been made to relocate district courthouses and county offices located in downtown Flint to a closed GM building in Grand Blanc. In addition to creating vacancies, what direct impact would a move like this have on the city of Flint's revenue and on its residents? So I'm thinking of parking meters. I'm thinking of uh, tax revenue, because if you work in the city of Flint, a half percent, even if you don't live in the city of Flint, a half percent of your income goes to the city. I'm thinking of the long-term impacts of what is going to happen with, you said the jail was included in that too, correct? Yes. With the jail, with the courthouses, because I mean, they're beautiful, the, not the jail, but the courthouse is a beautiful building. What's going to happen with that? Is that just going to remain vacant? Is that going to be an eyesore to welcome you to downtown? Hi, welcome to Flint. Here's this vacant building. We need to make sure that we figure out what are the true long-term impacts of doing something like this just to fill in another building in a town, you know, 10 miles south. So I would definitely need to be able to look more at the proposal and that language and be able to ask more questions, especially within the long-term side of things with that. Um, but based off of, you know, the information just shared, I, I would not support that. Okay. Ms. Galloway. So in addition to what was shared, um, I couldn't help but think about accessibility because if you move the courts, does that become a hindrance for the people that have to go there? People that um, struggle with mobility, will it be accessible bus line? Because if, if you did say the courts, Yes. Too, right? Yes. So when people have to go to court, um, how is that their ability to get there? They're, because downtown Flint is near the um, transportation center, so people that may not have vehicles can get there, but also people that, unfortunately, that visit their loved ones. What is the population of the inmates that are inside of the, the ones that we keep downtown. So in addition to all of those revenue things, what are the impact on people being able to get there? Is it going to create more of a hardship than not? And, and I don't know if, if that would um, affect jury pools. I don't know. And so yeah, it would um, require more investigation to find out why they're considering something like that and, and what would the alternative be. Okay. Allegations exist that there are council representatives who are either who either are not or were not legal residents of the ward they represent prior to being elected. On the face of it appears unethical, if not illegal considering council is compensated by taxpayers' dollars. Although it is, it is the ward's responsibility to ensure that candidates are qualified to run in an election, this does not necessarily occur. Wards are also responsible for recalling illegal representatives, but that doesn't often occur. What authority does council have to investigate claims alleging illegal residency? and what action can council take to unseat illegal council members? So, so council members have the ability to 
um, do hearings for cause. And we um, actually have the authority to remove according to the charter. The challenging thing with that, and, and I've been in Flint now for 26 years, 26 years, um, that's a running theme in the community. People that don't live in the community that run specifically. And I, I think that um, the, the state has been very silent on it. And then the county has been very silent on it. And then the, I mean, the city clerk, um, according to some, has been very silent on it. And so the challenge, though, is when you have that person, if that person leans towards your voting record, it's not to your best interest to do what is in the best interest of the community. And what I mean by that is if that person is one of my five, having one of my five sometimes may be more important than really investigating whether or not that's true. And the other piece is, you know, we can say it however we want to. When you have a husband and a wife that are clearly in great relationship with each other, saying that they live within two to three miles of each other, it's just alarming. If it's not illegal, it definitely has the perception of something that appears to be unethical. And so we do have the authority to do it. It's just that it may not be to the benefit of um, the council members as much as it would be beneficial to the, the ward that that person serves in. Okay. Yeah. Order. I think there should be a full validation of any kind of, or excuse me, investigation of any kind of claim that comes forth um, you know, questioning the validity of someone's home address um, a thousand percent because we need to make sure that we are following within the chartered law and making sure that we are representing the community which we say that we are here to represent. So I'm not entirely sure what the specific provisions of city council would be able to have for that, but wholeheartedly supporting the investigation and the confirmation of residents um, living where they say they live. Okay. All right, well, thank you. You all have been a wonderful audience. This concludes the Q&A form, portion of our form. I'd like to thank Councilwoman Galloway and Ms. Herkenroder. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm just really getting ahead of myself. Okay, but before we, before we move to the final portion, there is one final question. Finally, what do you believe makes you the best person to represent the residents of the seventh ward in city council? That's me, right? Yes. Um, I'm here today before everyone because I'm so excited and so ready to get down and do the work that needs to get done. I want to make sure that we are able to work together and come together as a community, whatever our differences and opinions may be, and make sure that we are still getting work done. We need to make sure that we are working for the city. We need to make sure that we're working for the community, and that's what I'm here to do. I'm not afraid of a challenge. I'm not afraid to put in the long hours, to put in the seven-day weeks, to make sure that we get done what needs to get done, because Flint deserves better than what it has. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Galloway. So, um, I am qualified, I am ready. Um, I am prepared and have served this community for the last eight years. This is um, not a time for risk. Since 2001, this community has lost over $100 million in revenue sharing spending. That means that the state of Michigan, instead of properly budgeting their, balancing their budget, they took $100 million just from this community, $1 billion from Detroit, but $100 million from this community since 2001. So now we have $94 million that will help to eliminate some of the challenges that we've had. And so why am I the most qualified? And, and I just want to uh, make sure the narrative is, is not set by others. I am passionate, I am experienced. City Council gets everything done. It takes a little longer than we'd like to, but there's nothing that hasn't been done. 
And it's important to remember, and I hope my community sees, because of your trust and your investment in me, I've had the opportunity to be elected to be the president of the Michigan Municipal League. That is Michigan legislators throughout the entire state of Michigan that give us access to other resources and other people to help us advance where we're going. And so I'm asking this community to make sure that on November 2nd, you are not misled. Are there some changes that need to happen on the city council? Maybe so. What's not supposed to change on city council is your representation. So on November 2nd, I am hoping that we will continue the progress that we made. And on November 2nd, you will reelect Monica Galloway for 7th Ward City Council. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, this concludes the Q&A portion of our forum. Thank you, Councilman Galloway and Ms. Herkenroder. I'm now going to turn over the mic to Jan Marie. Thank you, everybody. Do we have two outstanding candidates in our ward or what? We are so fortunate to have such dynamic, intelligent people representing the seventh ward. Thank you, ladies, for your forthright answers. Thank you for your preparation. Thank you for being able to respond on your feet. Thank you for being here to listen, to learn, and to be prepared to vote. I encourage all of you on November 2nd, get out and vote. Call your family, call your friends, pick them up if you need to, take them to the polls to vote. All right, now, just for a moment, we're going to meet a write-in candidate. That's an unusual thing in our area. It's an unusual thing in our city, right? But we have a number of write-in candidates for city council this year. Lakeisha Tarot, if you would please come to the mic. Lakeisha is going to be afforded two minutes. Our timekeeper, Ms. Turner, will let you know how things are going. Thank you, Ms. Jan Marie. Um, I really sincerely thank her because the writing in candidates, unfortunately, have not been given a platform. It's a form, actually, of voter suppression. So anyone who extends um, the microphone to me as the seventh ward writing candidate, I definitely appreciate and I applaud you for giving the voters an equal opportunity. Unfortunately, you all are not able to ask questions of myself because I only have a few minutes. But I can tell you a little bit about myself. I am born and raised here in the city of Flint. I have a passion for this city. I've been currently working in the community uh, with law enforcement. I've been working in the community with mental health. I'm a mental health advocate first and foremost. And I own and operate facilities here in the city of Flint because I don't believe we can address crime without addressing the mind. So I'm hoping you all will look up all the candidates to get a fair shot of getting the best representation here in the seventh ward in the city of Flint that you can have. Because right now for the next five years, with everything that's happened to us in the city of Flint, we need someone to finally represent the community and allow the people's voices to be heard instead of people coming in there with their own agenda and their own plans. Let's allow the people voice to speak. So I thank you all for listening to me for these few minutes. My name once again is Lakeisha Turo. I am the write-in candidate for the seventh war. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rowe, thank you so much. In case you don't know, as it regards writing candidates, there will be a forum on Thursday evening at the Hasselbring Center between 6 and 8 p.m. So I invite you, if your schedule permits and you're interested, please show up, take a listen, get to know who else is running for office. Now, I would truly be remiss if I did not acknowledge that a dear friend to the 7th Ward and a warrior for the people of the city of Flint is here with us tonight, 
First Ward Councilman Eric Mays. Mr. Mays, thank you so much for being here this evening. Thank you. Also in the house tonight is a candidate for eighth ward council seat, Mr. Dennis Pfeiffer. Thank you, Dennis, for being here. Remember that name, Dennis Pfeiffer. These are a lot of new people for us, everyone. Please do your due diligence. Is Mr. A.C. Dumas in the house? Oh, Mr. A.C. Dumas, thank you. Mr. A.C. Dumas is here with us. Mr. Dumas is running for third ward council. Again, everyone, we are so happy. Mr. Dumas, Mr. Pfeiffer, Councilman Mays, thank you for being here. And if I have overlooked oh, any other candidates, I apologize. Yep. Did I miss, is that Miss Muhammad? Miss mm -hmm. Muhammad is in the house. Audrey Young. Okay, Audrey, okay, what's your, on the ballot, what's your name? Thank you, thank you, 4 p.m., four, is it from four until six? Thank you so kindly, thank you, thank you so, more, so much. All right, everybody, last words, vote. Call your friends, call your family, vote. This is an extremely important election. We need your participation. We need everyone's participation. We want to reinvigorate our city. We want more people to feel as much passion as you do, as our candidates do. So please, let's get the word out. And that, everyone, concludes our forum. Thank you so kindly for coming out. Drive safely, have a great night, and we'll see you another time. Thank you, everybody. You did a great job.